hour long talks. And so when Paul told me I had to cut this to 20 minutes, basically they just took all the funny shit out. So um, <laughs> it's going to be real serious and sad. Um, sorry about that. There's not enough place for all my accoutrement up here. Um, so I'm Michael Leeling. I'll do a little bit of introductions in a minute. Um, I want to start. Uh, this should have been up here while I was kind of running up here, but I forgot to tell all that. So um, you'll figure out what I'm talking about soon enough. I want to start with a story. So third grade, uh, I grew up in New York, gym class. I'm 41 years old, so this was this is about what it looked like. That's not actually my high school or my, my elementary school gymnasium, but uh, my teacher, a gym teacher, would walk in. Uh, Dead ringer for David Hasselhoff, only with a mustache. Her name was Mrs. Pazarakis. Um, we used to call her Spazarakis. Um, she, we walk in and there's a rope hanging from the ceiling with a like one inch rotten mat on the floor underneath it. And she's like, we're gonna climb that rope today. We're third graders, we have the upper body strength of third graders. <laughs> like, and we're like, oh, fuck that, that's not gonna happen. And so, it's terrifying. It's 25 feet up. Like she's just like climb up there, touch the ceiling, come back down. Well, besides Carter Schwartz, who's like the hairy backed man child of Lewisboro Elementary, none of us think we're going to be able to do that. Well, so Carter goes first. He just climbs up there and he's like gets to the top, touches the ceiling. Uh -huh, yeah. And I was like, oh God. So a couple other people go. They fail. You know, they don't fall, but they don't. They make it three feet off the ground. Then it's my turn. So while I do have the upper body strength of a whatever, 11 year old at the time, I have two things going for me. One, my mom always kept me in super sweet sneakers. So I had, you know, the vulcanized death grip of my Adidas that I was wearing. And I had a penchant for wearing brown corduroys every single day in elementary school. And so the wide whale had a lot of grip on the uh, inner thigh region. So I started to get up there, and I just kind of scrambled my way about six, seven feet up, and all of a sudden the thought enters my mind, what if I fall? And I just sort of freeze. And I look down at Mrs. Bazaragas, and I'm like, what if I fall? And in my recollection, she's definitely smoking a cigarette. <laughs> she's like, do you want to fall? And I'm like, and she's like, she starts yelling at the entire class, do any of you assholes want to fall? <laughs> that would be fair, she probably didn't say assholes. But it was the 80s in New York, she probably said a lot of fuckers. <laughs> she was definitely probably snorting cocaine at the time. But I was up there and I thought about it for a second. I'm like, well, no, I don't want to fall. I was like, no. And she's like, well, you won't. And so I scrambled and I scratched and I made it to the top of that rope. But here's the thing. Thank you. Well, third, third grade me says thank you. Um, I made it to the top, but the entire time there's this voice in my head saying, you're going to fall. You're going to crash into that shitty mat on the floor. Your dumb brown corner are going to split open. And your super sweet sneakers are going to fly off your feet like you got in a car accident victim. Never was going to laugh to you. That voice is my anxiety. That's my imposter complex. I like to call him Benicio. <laughs> and he's been there my entire life. And the dynamic has pretty much always been the same. Internal doubt and anxiety, of external confidence and success. Constantly my battling the feeling of being an imposter. I'm great at getting myself halfway up that rope, but I'm never quite sure if I can make it to the top. And even when I do make it to the top, I'm always sure that every single person I interact with can tell I have no idea what I'm doing or how I got there. I'm really great at rallying enthusiasm and confidence from others for me to succeed, but the entire time the background vocals are going to my head that I don't know what I'm doing and the panic steps in. So let me give you a little background on uh, who I am and what we're going to talk about today. Um, as Paul said, I'm the creative director and founder at Occupop. We're a small agency. We've been around for almost 20 years. Uh, we uh, started the company in 2000. We have a few small studios across the country. Uh, we do work for all sorts of big brand names that you've heard of and a ton that you haven't. Um, we do have a studio here in Milwaukee. I spend the summers here in Milwaukee, but then I get the fuck out when it's shit. I live in Hawaii the rest of the year. Um, and uh, beyond that, 
thanks to my success and the success of our firm, um, I've been asked to do a lot of talks like this. Generally, I try to share the stories that got us to where we are today. I try to share the philosophies of Rossi's that continue to shape our practices and, and, and our philosophies at the office. Um, this is my story. This stuff may not work for you. But ultimately, I hope you can at least find a few nuggets of goodness in here. At the very least, you're going to be able to pat yourself on the back without being as big of a dipshit as I am, all right? So, all right. Usually, I start these talks with a series of disclaimers. Um, in the spirit of time, I wasn't able to do that today, but there's one thing I should get out of the way first. I have a zoology degree. I've taken one design marketing class in my entire life. I have taught orders of magnitude more than design marketing classes at colleges across the country than I have ever taken. I have no business being up here. Uh, but the reality was, is I was actually, don't go in there yet. I was, uh, I was pre-med in college. That's why I got the zoology degree. I didn't have a general bio degree when I went to school. It's all the pre-med people got zoology degrees. Um, when I was in my senior year of college, I was getting ready to go to med school, and I realized I really was only doing it because I thought it seemed like a good job. I, I didn't wasn't passionate about it. I just there was a little element of it that was punk rock because my dad, the place where I went to high school, was uh, Rochester, Minnesota, and the Mayo Clinic was there, and, uh, and this huge IBM plant was there. And my dad was an IBMer, and that's how punk rock I was. I was like, well, fuck that. I'm not being an engineer. I'm gonna be a doctor. <laughs> um, but reality was that I wasn't passionate about it, and so I was. My brother and I were both pretty good snowboarders. And so we decided we were going to become pro snowboarders. And we've been competing and, and, and such. And so we moved to Colorado. And that was our plan. Become more pro snowboarders by moving to Colorado. Like, period. Full stop. <laughs> well, it worked well enough anyway. I, got, I made enough money from snowboarding and very shitty odd jobs to be a you know, subsidized professional child for a number of years. It was really great. I got to travel around, do all sorts of fun stuff with friends, see a lot of cool things, experience a lot of cool experiences. But the reality was, during that time, it was wonderful to have, to be free of the underlying pressures and tests and, and anxieties in real life. But during that time, that voice in my head, that doubting, questioning voice, my anxiety was there louder than ever during that time. I really felt like an imposter. I feel even more like one now talking about it. I was never good enough to be a pro snowboarder. I was barely good enough to not be embarrassed to ride and compete against the guys that were the real deal. And so over time, that questioning undercurrent, that doubt, that anxiety was wearing on me. And unbeknownst to me, that anxiety was slowly wearing its way into depression. So in 2000, I was at a team meeting for one of the companies I was getting sponsored by three year from. And the CEO of the company goes, we're gonna have a website next year, like next season. It's gonna be awesome. And then they start complaining about it's gonna cost us like ten thousand dollars. This is ridiculous. And I'm in the back of the room and I raise my hand. Fuck that. I'll build it for five hundred bucks. And he's like, you know how to build websites? I'm like, totally. And I went to the library and I check out a book on how to build websites. <laughs> Photoshop 4.1 or whatever it was back then, and I figured out how to build that website. And so that quickly dovetailed into catalogs and trade show booths and things in industries beyond snowboarding, restaurants, Medicare, everything else. And it, the dynamic wasn't exactly the same every time, but it was kind of scrambling halfway up that rope and then fucking figuring out how to get to the top while you know, sweating. Not eating, not sleeping, and having panic attacks all the time. So, let me jump to the next slide here. I used to call that, oh my god. Okay, I skipped ahead, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, I was in hours, I'm moving very quickly here. So, um, I used to call this the charm hustle cycle. So it's basically win them over, get them to believe that you can do what, what you said you're going to do, and then hurry up and get busy figuring out how to do it. Later on, we started to call this the fuck no shit gas yes cycle. <laughs> so if anyone asks questions, you can find I've done dozens and dozens of these talks. This is supposed to be a circle, not an oval. Um, it's a room of design marketing professionals. They don't notice that sort of thing. Um, 
So I went, anxiety is first. What's wrong with screaming in my ear? You're a piece of shit in music. Look at all these people around you. You think you're successful, you're full of shit. And I was never able to objectively refute that asshole. So when anxiety is telling you you're an imposter and you can't get through it wrong and you're never achieving success and everyone else is killing it, what do you do? You overwork, you overtrain, you overprepare. So if I felt like an imposter, I was sure as shit never would have let anyone on to it, right? And so I would work 16 hour days all the time. I would respond to emails in the middle of the night. I would make sure that people saw I was working at 12 a.m. and they saw I was working again at 4 a.m. I wanted to build a facade and be a superhero that could do anything. And this worked kind of on a number of levels of work. One, the more I worked, the more I felt like I was getting closer to that, or I felt like I was at least trying to achieve that level of success or wealth that I was hoping to aim for. Secondly, it worked because now I'm going to be confident or comfortable or whole. People around us were blown away. Everyone couldn't believe how responsible we were. They couldn't believe how fast we got things done. We would get shit done that people expected to get done in a week, we would get done in a day. Things that, you know, so people were, I would work, I took calls at 2 a.m. on Easter morning, whatever it was. I was always available, and not because people needed to be me, but because I told them I was available. I was a superhero, and I could do anything. I worked incredibly hard to build that reputation, and I worked even harder to maintain it. I lied about the shirt family obligations. I would never in a million years say, no, I'm sorry, I can't get that done over 4th of July weekend. I'm going to be camping with my kids. Fuck that. No, I would actually say, well, would you like me to get it done over 4th of July weekend? And I'd cancel the camping trip and work. At home, basically I was begging people to ruin my nights and weekends. And you have to imagine, at home, my life was pretty uneven. I was a good dad. I would play with my kids. I loved them. But every time I'd be trudging across the lawn, dragging them by each foot, I'd have my phone dragging along with me. Same thing in my marriage. Sarah and I would do fun, romantic things that normal married couples do, we'd go on trips, we'd have nice dinners. But I was never fully there. I was never present. Because I was constantly tethering that phone and work along with me. Our, all of our good times as a family and all of our bad times were being dictated by dipshits on the other side of the planet. And I was the one bringing it in. So, I didn't think I was going to have time to do this, but I'm going to go for it. Where, where am I at? Timing wise. No, I don't have time to do it. You guys don't get it. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, the reasons in retrospect for this are simple. I built up that facade too much to let it crumble and realize a regular person. Two, every hour every day had monetary value to me. And so, if I wasn't going to work my ass off, how was I going to achieve that level of success? So all that left me detached, I wrote I loved, I was on edge and short, and constantly wound up and I felt guilty for any moment I wasn't working. So then in the winter of 2012, middle of the night, I wake up, screaming, double over in pain. I can't breathe, I can't, my entire left side of my body is numb, I, my chest is collapsing, I'm having a heart attack, 36 years old. I reach over and I wake my wife up, and I tell her what's happening, she freaks out. In my life of being a skateboarder somewhere, I've hurt myself in many, many, many creative ways. And I have never not been able to pull my shit together, at least calm down enough to be like, all right, it's gonna be all right. I felt like I was dying. So I got to the airport, or I got to the airport, the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna die if I just won't get you out Okay. Um, so the reality is, is that the doctor came in, they had sedated me, and I woke up, and he's like, you don't sleep very much, do you? I was like, I did like four hours a night. I was like proud of that, because that was the facade. Like our, like our dipshit president, I was the brag about the same sort of crap. Um, and so, he's like, you didn't have a heart attack. He's like, you probably felt like a heart attack. You probably fully believed you were dying. He's like, that was a panic attack. Now, years of all these minor sort of anxiety attacks and, and, and living with anxiety, I'd never had an attack like that before. But it shouldn't have been a surprise. Through the two years leading up to that, I hadn't been sleeping, I hadn't been eating, I was a mess. Um, I would wake up in the morning and all, like, at this point, it's, that attack was a tipping point. Shit went downhill from there. Like, I fell into a full-on depression, I could do nothing. I would wake up in the morning and all I wanted to do was go back to sleep but I couldn't sleep. So I tried to throw myself into work, but I had no motivation, 
no creativity. I was certainly not prolific like I had been before. So then I decided to make the fox go away and the darkness go away with nauseating levels of exercise. I would run forever and get home, rehydrate, go bike forever, get home, go back to the gym and do a workout. You can't breathe, you can't think, was kind of my philosophy. But the reality was, is none of it was really working. And so then I felt like I was drowning physically and mentally 24 hours a day, except for when I was with my kids. I was gasping for oxygen and they became sort of my, my vitality. I craved time with them. Every day was centered around them. I would count the minutes so I could pick them up from daycare. I just needed them to be with me. I needed them to play with me. Suddenly, the person who got pissed off when someone called, like, they got pissed off when, and I would take calls at 2 a.m. Like I said, now I'm going to get pissed off if someone called during dinner or even dared to ask me to work on the weekends because it was digging into my time with them because they were the only thing that made me feel whole. So ultimately, at that moment, when everything went to shit, all I needed to be, I didn't want to be a superhero to anyone anymore. I just want to be a dad. I want to be a husband. And so, but what about when they weren't there? Well, when I bought it out, I was lightheaded most of the time, and I'm not a very big guy, but I was down to about 120 pounds, which is about 40 pounds less than I weigh now. I finally decided I needed to go find a therapist. Now, I'm going to go to this point in my life, and this is going to sound really bad. I hope there's a therapist somewhere. <laughs> Mine is in Milwaukee. Didn't invite her. Um, <laughs> uh, I thought therapy was pretty much bullshit. I, was, I never faced anything in my life that I couldn't do on my own. I couldn't scramble up that rope and figure out how to get to the top. But in this case, I knew I could handle it. And I was like, I need help. So ultimately, it's easy enough. I went to uh, the you know, our insurance company website, found the counseling clinic closest to us, and I booked an appointment. Two days later, I'm in the waiting room, a little water feature in the corner, you know, fucking better, better homes and gardens, and whatever, and everything. And I, the therapist walks in, and it's, it's my grandma Wilma. Like, it's this, like, 75-year-old woman, and needless to say, sharing my greatest challenges, my deepest secrets, my most intimate thoughts with a septuagenarian, while very adorable and nice one, only added to my anxiety. So I went home, opened the computer again, and I booked appointments with six other therapists. And I didn't know exactly what I was looking, looking for, but I shared the same things with each of them. I broke down the same ways. I lost my shit about the same stuff. And I kind of had a general framework of what I was looking for. One, I knew they needed to be smarter than me. I didn't want to be able to control that conversation. I wanted them to be nice, but I didn't want them to be just a shoulder to cry on. I also, I wanted to tear down my unlivable life, my unrealistic dynamic, with the same tenacity I built it up with. I didn't know how to do it, but I wanted to rebuild it all. And I needed an architect to help me draw the plans. So first of all, the first one was too old. Uh, the second one couldn't keep up. The third and the fourth were super nice, but they were too nice. They totally could bullshit them and control the conversation. The fifth one is the one I actually went with, or I almost went with, but when I was meeting with six and seven, my wife stole her. And so I had to go to that one. The sixth one was a dude. Oddly, it's the only man that I ever met with. Something about sharing this stuff with a woman felt more comfortable to me. Weirdly, I have never revisited this obvious mommy issue, or whatever it is, <laughs> in the last five years of therapy. But the reality is, is that I almost stuck with the guy, but the seventh one said something to me about halfway through our first session that totally made me made my decision for me. She looks up from her notes and goes, fuck you, tell me why you really did that. <laughs> you had to get fucked. <laughs> and so, we decided to work together, and at the time, I actually was seeing her three days a week. Like, sometimes an hour and a half at a time, because I was in crisis. And she slowly started to help me, you know, she was brilliant, she was systematic and sophisticated. She had the comics paired with the credentials, and she slowly started me to help me start to see things differently. Just started to help me see everything I had. And I started questioning everything I thought. I reconsidered my definition of success and realized that I kind of already had it. This whole time I've been aiming for the wrong thing. She helped me to start to do things and see things differently. Started by simple things. Scheduling meetings when I could do meetings, not when I thought other people might want them to happen. Started 
charging for work what it was worth, not what, you know, not giving it away. And, you know, uh, basic deadlines on you know when the work could get done, not when we thought maybe they might want it done. And so the weird, crazy thing is, is that there was almost zero resistance. In almost all cases, it was kind of a matter of fact. And the crazy thing is, is that even when I was a master, completely non-functional, the company did great. When I was back to being just a normal person, not a super, superhero, it did even better. So in the end, I learned how to be a better leader, a better father, I learned how to delegate. So ultimately, how did I get to this? How did I get to a point where I am in a lot better place, where I handle that anxiety a lot better, where that imposter complex shuts the heck up? Well, lots of therapy at the beginning, but most, the biggest thing was being comfortable in my own skin. Being, being good, being exemplary, but not worrying about being unrealistically super heroic. Ultimately, think about it. What's the one thing I want to hear you guys say when I get in front of a room of 200 people and say, I suck, I don't know what I'm doing, I have been riddled with anxiety, I, I, I feel like an imposter. What are the two words I want to hear you say? Shit, yeah. Is that, yeah, or me too, right? Like, you want that solidarity, that empathy. And the way shit, yeah, is in the more enthusiastic side of the solidarity, <laughs> so I like that. Um, but Brene Brown, who you may have heard of, is a doctor, and she researches this shit, and she's actually a good public speaker. You should watch her TED talk. Um, but she says it's shame. Feelings of being an imposter can't survive empathy. And the only way you get to empathy is through opening up and sharing. And so I started doing that. I started sharing my shame, my stresses, my challenges with all my friends and family and coworkers. And the reality is like not that me too. None of those people knew what they were doing. None of those people figured it out just instantly. Not my super successful rich friends, not Obama, not Trump, obviously. <laughs> They're all just figuring it out as they go along, right? Some better than others. Um, <sighs> So I dropped, the, dropped the facade, I just started being me, and I started being you know, vulnerable. I got that perspective, I, and I felt better. I have learned to manage my anxiety and my imposter complex through all these things, through therapy, through setting up realistic expectations, but more than anything else, through being authentic and being vulnerable. I constantly need to remind myself that I am who I am, and I have my high points, and I have my low points, and I shouldn't be ashamed to admit them, to share them, to even leverage them. Ultimately, think about it. Whose voice? Does Benicio sound remarkably like? It's yours, it's mine. We're our own worst critic, right? And so ultimately sharing myself, opening myself up, being more me to more people has made my imposter complex way more inspiring and, 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 and remarkable to way more people than any fake superhero could have ever been. I want to finish with actually being articulate. Solidarity, empathy, sharing, that's where the solace is. That's the sure way to vanquish those imposter feelings. And you already connect with people on that level and render that asshole in your head of you through honesty, transparency, and vulnerability. Because ultimately, the easiest, the easiest thing about telling the truth is you don't need to think about what to say. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you.